the next region of our brain is the hippocampus. The name may sound familiar because in Greek mythology is used, and also in things like Percy Jackson is used. Hippocampus literally means seahorse. And the reason why this part of the brain is called that because when you look at the region separate from the rest of the brain, it kind of has the shape of a seahorse. So what this one's important for us is we're taking our short-term memory and turning it into long-term memory. So when you have damage to this, you can see where people can go from not being able to take information they just learn and ever remembering it. So it can be, if this is damaged, it can become a big problem for your ability to store new memories. So here's the reason why. Here's the hippocampus in the brain. You can see where a seahorse is. It has a general appearance. It looks like it. That's the reason why we call it the hippocampus. It's one of the first regions that's damaged in Alzheimer's. That's why we spike have the paradox about Alzheimer's where they can't remember things that just happened, but sometimes they'll remember things from 40 years ago. Because those memories are still stored, have been there, they're not new, so they can retrieve those memories, but they can't remember what just happened five minutes ago. Because this part of the brain has been damaged and you can no longer take the information and put it into uh, new storage, basically. It's like having a computer, but nothing new can be stored on it, only the stuff that's on there can be used because you've damaged the ability to input anything new. It's kind of the same concept. Stress also plays a huge role in this and can actually affect the way we remember things. There's one reason why a lot of criminal trials are talking about the fact that it's unreliable for eyewitness testimony because under high stress and under high stress, psychologists have shown this sometimes turns off or loses the details because it gets overridden. And so it can't remember all the details. And so people get confused by what happened. And so it's hard to sometimes remember it under stress what happened, all the different details. That normally have if you're under calm situations, you'd be able to look at it and put it into storage and remember the details. But under stress, not so much. That's why if you stress out about tests, sometimes it doesn't work well for you because you can't remember what you tried to do because you overruled this section of the brain. The brain stem, which is the next portion, is a bundle of nerves that connects to the cerebrum and the spinal cord, basically the connection cable. Here's your hardware, I want to connect everything in, I need some, a port in order to do it. This is kind of the port region that allows you to connect everything up. So, the midbrain is the first section. You know, I know called every part of the brain the midbrain. Traditionally, this is the midbrain of the human brain. It has the cerebral peduncles, fun name. Serves the pathway between the cerebrum and cerebellum. This is a transfer zone. It allows you to make, take information from one to the other and back and forth so they can communicate. The corpus quadrigemini, as the name implies, there are four parts to it. It has the nuclei that run the reflex centers for the muscles that control your eye, head, trunk, and movements, uh, trunk movements. So it helps to move my body around as a reflex. So if you flinch, those flinches are going to this region. This is the region right at the base of the brain. It's not going up here to be interpreted by my cerebrum. It's just basically coming to this point and then reacting. So it's a quicker method to do that. The pons is a rounded bulge that's located in the under, underside of the brain stem. It's also a relay station. In this case, the relay is between the cerebrum and the medulla, which is the bottom portion of my brainstem. So instead of going to my cerebellum, it's helping to transfer information down and then off eventually into the spinal cord. This is also where my breathing is regulated. So it's not controlling breathing 100%, but it's regulating my breathing. So if I were to damage this, the problem is I would shut off my ability to regulate my breathing, which is a problem. Medulla oblongata. It's the final portion of the brainstem. Really, it's, some people say it's just the spinal cord. They kind of run into each other. There's no one stop and one start kind of motion. We said, here's roughly the area it starts, and here's where it stops. It's white matters on the outside, just like the spinal cord. It has all ascending tracks. And the gray matters on the inside has all descending tracks. So it's kind of similar set up the way the spinal cord is. It has pyramid cells in it, or pyramidal cells in it. These are the lower, lower motor neurons. These are where I cross over signals between the right and left side. So signals come down here, they cross over to here, and here, they cross over to here, and do that. The gray matter on the inside has reflex centers as well that allow me to do a number of different things, like control my heart rate. So my heart has the ability to adjust as a reflex to situations that, that are occurring. My blood pressure can react to situations without the brain thinking about it, without having a conscious control over it or respiratory again, so there's two parts for breathing here. So if this is damaged again, these shut off my ability of my heart to react, my blood, my blood vessels to react, and my breathing to react. So my cardiovascular system completely stops, which is why if you break the bottom part of the skull, or like right at the base of the skull, you break the spinal cord and brainstem, that's it. 
people don't survive that because when you break the spinal cord right there, that shuts off the ability of your, of your vital organs to function anymore. So again, here's your pyramidal tracts, the pons is right here. This comes into the spinal cord right here off this medulla oblongata down this way. The side view shows you the medulla oblongata here, so the shield shape coming into the spinal cord, cerebral peduncles on both sides. The final portion would be the cerebellum or the little brain. It's called that because it looks like a small version of the bigger brain, but it's attached to the back, the back side of the brain. It also has two hemispheres, but in this case, there's no actual fissure. It's, it's actually connected by a ridge. That ridge is called the central vermis. It's called the central vermis because vermis means worm in Latin, and therefore it's worm-like. It kind of goes across the top like a worm going over it. It has a thin cortex of gray matter on the outside, and on the inside, white matter, just like we see in things like the cerebrum. So it's got a similar layout that way. The convolutions on the outside are called folia. And there's a reason why we use the word folia. Folia refers to leaves. And we'll get to that concept of why that becomes valid in a second. We still have grooves called sulci. But instead of gyri, we call folia for a very specific reason. They're not very deep compared, they're not very as big as you see with the gyri on the, the cerebrum. But here's the reason why we call folia, the arbor vita. Arbor vita translates to white tree or tree of life. It is the tree of life. So what do trees have on the outside? Leaves. So that's why these are the, the outside of these branches have the little folds, which are called the folia. It's called tree of life because the white matter makes a branching pattern from the inside. It looks like a little tree pattern. The cerebral peduncles are here, or sorry, cerebellar peduncles. There are three paired bundles of fibers connected in the rest of the brain. The, the brain, they allow you to send signals everywhere else in the brain through these little relay stations. This is your automatic pilot for motor responses. So it helps control coordination skills and things like that. So it allows us for smooth movements. So instead of me being all like everywhere like this, I can control it and make my movements nice and fluid and smooth. It gives us that ability to do that. It also helps us maintain posture so I can stay upright instead of falling over and tipping over all the time. So instead of when I walk and I don't just fall over, I can stay upright. Here's my cerebellum. You can see the tree of life, the little white patterns right here, so it sort of branches off and the foliar little ridges on the outside. 